So the first three minutes. Well, before we do that, the universe today, the headlines would be that there are four forces in nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. And scientists have two theories that describe everything. General relativity, which describes the first of those, gravity, and quantum mechanics, which covers the other three. Uh, our biggest problem in theoretical physics is trying to make those two into one theory that fits everything. And that's been uh, a challenge for 50 years or more. So right back at the beginning, in the first 10 to the minus 44 of a second, space was less than 10 to the minus 35 meters across. These numbers are the Planck time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds, and the Planck length, 10 to the minus 35 meters. And the uh, ratio between them is the speed of light. The, uh, the, you would find that light could travel one Planck length in one Planck time unit. So it was a tiny little thing. Of course, all of the energy and matter being packed so closely together creates an enormous amount of gravitational curvature of the space and of time. In fact, it becomes so complicated and entangled that it's really a chaotic foam is a way of thinking about it. So chaotic is it that there aren't really any clear notions of the difference between here and there, or now and then, or before and after. These concepts of the difference between space and, the, and time really don't mean anything in this very, very first instant of time, or instant of the existence of the universe. So this is called the Planck Epoch, and it's the time when all four of the forces, gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak force, and electromagnetism, were all combined as one unified uh, single entity. And the whole universe is a gravitational singularity, essentially um, a massive, highly energetic quantum black hole. Now, we can say all of this, we can't do the maths because our equations blow up in our face at this level. So this is a uh, strong hypothesis rather than what you might call a solid theory. So what happened next? Well, for some unknown reason, expansion kicks in. And this is really the Big Bang starting. And if you want to know what caused the Big Bang, then unfortunately you probably need a philosopher or a priest to answer the question rather than a scientist at this point, because we have no idea. What we do believe though, is that the expansion kicked in and gr gravity emerged because space time emerged from the chaos the other four, uh, the other three forces remained um, unified, and the universe was just a soup of energy with a temperature of 10 to the power 32 degrees Kelvin. So hot that everything was flying around, uh, and uh, there was so much energy that no particle was able to condense at this temperature. It would be destroyed by an interaction as soon as it did. And so around 10 to the minus 37 of a second after the Big Bang, so that's quite a few Planck times later, if you work it out, we've gone from 10 to the minus 44 to 10 to the minus 37. That's um, a, a, an increase in time of a factor of uh, 10 million. And the expansion has cooled the universe 
down to a temperature of only 10 to the power 28 degrees Kelvin. And at this point, the universe underwent some sort of phase change, which gave it a huge kick, which uh, scientists call inflation, uh, which was the, an idea from Alan Guth uh, back in the uh, late 70s, which suggested that the universe suddenly began expanding because of this, uh, what he calls a false vacuum state, which is a little bit too complicated to explain. But it's something changed and caused this inflation to kick off. And then 10 times further into the universe, at 10 to the minus 36 of a second, the temperature dropped enough with the expansion that the strong nuclear force was able to separate away from the electro magnetic and weak forces leaving those two combined and that's another of example of these phase changes that gives the universe a further push in expansion you can think of a phase change um, as what happens when you boil your kettle you make the water turn into steam water vapor it's changing phase from the liquid phase to the gas phase and you have to put energy in in that case but if you stick your hand over the top of the kettle while this is happening, and I wouldn't recommend you try it, you'll burn your hand on the steam because the steam will recondense. It'll undergo the energy dropping uh, phase change and release a vast amount of heat into your hand and burn it. And it's these downward dropping phase changes in the early universe that we're talking about. So it's as if the universe was condensing from a more volatile to a less volatile state. So a word about inflation and why we think it was there. We think it increased the size of the universe at an en enormous rate in this very short time period um, between 10 to the minus 37 and 10 to the minus 32 seconds. It increased the extent of the universe by a factor of 10 to the power 26, an absolutely enormous number. And we believe that because of the cosmic microwave background radiation that we observe being so nearly perfectly smooth. The idea is that in the inflation expanding the universe by such an enormous amount effectively ironed out all the quantum ripples that there would have been that would have existed on uh, quite small time uh, size scales uh, to exist over much larger size scales and therefore appear nearly flat much as the ant on the balloon here as the uh, balloon begins to be inflated the ant can see the curvature of the surface of the balloon but if you blew the balloon up to the size of the universe then the ant can't see that the uh, surface is in fact curved it looks flat to it it's the same idea and again the temperature is always dropping as the universe expands so we're now down to 10 to the 22 kelvins Now, there is an issue that's uh, associated with, with this and why we believe that um, inflation solves it. And that is that, again, the cosmic microwave background radiation has the same temperature all over the sky. And it's as if somehow it all got together and agreed what temperature it was going to be at. Now, normally heat flows from hot regions to cold regions and equalizes the temperature. But it can only do that at a speed at absolute maximum if it's being carried by radiation at the speed of light. That's the maximum rate at which heat can flow from one hot part of the universe to a cold part. And so hot regions and cold regions that were too far apart would not be able to reach an equilibrium and end up at the same temperature. And the way that inflation solves this is saying, ah, yes, but they were all able to 
spend long enough together when the universe was very, very tiny to get into equilibrium. And then inflation carried the regions apart so that they were made to be all the same temperature when they were very close together and then carried outside of the range of a speed of light based temperature equi equivalence building process. I hope that's uh, clear. So that is really why we believe in inflation. So I'm going to skip forwards to 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And these time units actually have names. They're a picosecond for 10 to the minus 12. And 10 to the minus 9 is a microsecond. And microseconds are starting to get into almost a, a sensibly short period of time that uh, we worry about. It's um, the same sort of time as one clock tick of the uh, uh, chip in your mobile phone uh, one microsecond so uh, is, these are things we deal with every day these days but during this period the weak force and the electromagnetic force is decoupled from each other they're coupled when the temperature is very very high but as the temperature falls and things start moving around more slowly you start to be able to see another of these phase changes uh, and the uh, forces become distinguishable. And the universe then fills with quarks, the components of uh, protons and neutrons. But at 10 to the minus 6, at one microsecond, the temperature is now low enough for the quarks to start sticking together to make things much more familiar in the form of the protons and the neutrons that go to build atoms that we are ourselves made of. And so the universe from one microsecond onwards is much more familiar to us than the uh, rather peculiar uh, states from uh, earlier epochs. We have the four forces all separated and we have matter in the form of neutrons and protons and of course there are electrons involved as well. And so things then are quite familiar. And in fact, next three minutes, the rest of the three minutes that I'm talking about, we just see the expansion lowering the temperature. And the universe is full of a hot plasma of protons and neutrons flying around. But as the temperature drops and reaches 10 to the 9 degrees Kelvin, that's 1 billion degrees it's uh, now such that the energy of the particles allows nuclear fusion to work temperatures above a billion and you find that the uh, energy of the particles is so vast that the products of nuclear fusion the helium at the bottom of the diagram there get destroyed by other particles hitting them faster than they're made so you don't really get anywhere but below a billion degrees you're talking about the sort of temperature that occurs in the middle of the largest stars and fusion can run and runs quite quickly driving the hydrogen to form deuterium helium-3 and helium-4 as shown on the diagram and then expansion is continuing by the time you get to three minutes the temperature has dropped below 10 million degrees and now the universe is too cold for fusion to begin the uh, hydrogen at the top there needs a temperature of at least 10 million in order to be moving fast enough for the fusion to deuterium the second step to occur and so once the uh, three minutes is up and the temperature cools down you've now got a, a temperature and a density lower than the core of the smallest type of star the red dwarf star and fusion switches off so you get this burst of three minutes of pressure cooker action making hydrogen into the slightly heavier elements and in fact the full diagram is is here we get protons 
and neutrons at the bottom p and n and they turn into the isotopes of hydrogen deuterium and tritium d and t those can turn into helium 3 and helium 4 and all the arrows represent different possible paths that that can take on the diagram depending on what collides with what and that's indicated in the little brackets there so where it says uh, p comma gamma that's a proton hitting something and a gamma ray emerging that's what that means and you can see that it also starts to try to build elements beyond helium so the at the very top there we have beryllium 7 and we've also got lithium 7 up there and you can see that those can be made by taking helium 3 and the arrow leading to beryllium 7 says 4 he so a helium 4 nucleus adds to a helium 3 and gives you beryllium 7 but then what it says is there's a downward going arrow that uh, that could be hit by a neutron and give out a proton and you end up with lithium 7 and that can be split apart again by being hit by a proton and fissioned back into two heliums so there's a sort of cycle that goes on and so you don't get much lithium or beryllium made by this process because you only get the little tiny amounts that happen to be in play in that cycle when the music stopped at three minutes and the temperature got low enough for all these reactions not to be possible and so it left the universe with 75 percent hydrogen 24 percent helium and a very small amount of some of the other elements that just were the intermediate products of these cycles and sort of froze out when the music stopped